Tonight's reading is from Malachi, chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 9, and you'll find that on page 961 of the Pew Bible. Admonition for the Priests. And now this admonition is for you, O priests. If you do not listen, and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them, because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the awful from your festival sacrifices, and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this admonition so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. And I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing was false, false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned many from sin. From the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. But you have turned from the way, and by your teaching you have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So... I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Amen. A few weeks ago, we had a sermon uh, talk back at uh, Life Builders uh, when Damien and I fielded questions that had been uh, sent in on the two series which, uh, in which we were engaged. And one arising from uh, the book of Revelation uh, led someone to ask the question, is Bloomfield a lukewarm church? And Damien, in his wisdom and charity, let me answer that one first. And uh, my response was, Every church faces the danger of being lukewarm. And that wasn't just a snide uh, kind of hope there isn't a follow-up kind of answer. That, to my mind, is very true. Now, when we're looking at Malachi, um, when I'm preparing, I, I always look at a number of translations, and the last one I go to is the message And what I don't normally do is read the introduction to each book which uh, Peterson has. But I found out, I don't know why I read it, it's just uh, half a page. Uh, I read it, but he talks about Malachi ministering to a, a humdrum period. Why does he say that? And he contrasts ministering in the humdrum with ministering in a crisis. Well, if you think of Malachi and think of where the people of Israel have come, what they've come through. Well, they were in exile. They had been defeated against their will. They had all been carried off into a foreign land, and there they were stuck for a couple of generations, and then they were allowed to 
come home. They thought, great, now we can rebuild Jerusalem, which had been devastated, uh, uh, and the walls and everything had been knocked down, and the temple was in ruins, and they found that the people who were there weren't very happy about that. And so in in Nehemiah, we read of them uh, having a, a sword belted to one side and then a trowel in the other, and they, they rebuilt the walls of the city and later rebuilt uh, the temple. But th- that was in the past, and boys, oh, they needed God. They needed a strong and perceptive and God-fearing leader, and that they found in Nehemiah and later in Ezra, But but now that was a thing of the past. And when things get easier, you get a bit more easygoing. I I, I look back in my ministry. Now, I started off, I was very young, of course, uh, in the 60s. And just, I was ordained just before the Troubles. And then, much to my surprise, in a few years, And to my family, because there was one place I would never work in, and that was Derry, I ended up just there. And things were lively. And people knew they needed God, and church was well attended, and prayer meetings, we had things to pray about. And at that time, things were also lively in the church, there was this charismatic movement and renewal and uh, churches began to divide and some people went off to join the various fellowships and some of them came back to the churches and some of them are elders here and they're the better for their uh, their wanderings. Uh, And we had to face the issue of in what way is the spirit working in the church and that caused a lot of, uh, you know, not exactly argy-bargy, But now things are fairly tranquil. Or have I been sleeping? (laughs) You know, there there isn't any real get up and go or, Lord, we really need you, or it's a bit humdrum. And so Malachi has a word for us as he had a word for his situation. Last week, we were away uh, looking at grandchildren. Uh, 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 but last week we were on Malachi 1. And it, it was a kind of what I would call um, charity shop uh, Christianity. Now, don't uh, listen. Uh, six months before we moved house, every uh, Saturday morning we went into Newton Ards with uh, that week's load for the charity shop. It was stuff which we no longer wanted, but it might be of some value to somebody. And so we gave it to the charity shop, and they were pleased to receive it. And because we had signed a covenant form every uh, month or so, when we were in, they said, oh, and last month we did this, and so we're getting taxed by all that kind of thing. Uh, now, now, that's of value. But here in chapter 1... Oh, yes, they were carrying on with the sacrifices, but now it was, you know, if you had a chicken with a wooden leg, that was what you gave to the Lord. The animals that were ill, they they went through the motions, but there wasn't the reality and there wasn't the commitment. They had forgotten at the end of chapter 1 that the Lord wasn't only the Lord of Israel, but we'd be glorified amongst the nations. Now, in our passage tonight, Malachi's focus turns to the priests. Turns to the priests. And we'll turn to prayer. Lord, the situation then and now is very different, and yet it is very similar. As we would listen to what Malachi says to his generation, help us to listen to what you say through his words to us this evening. And may you be glorified in 
Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm dividing this into, I'm a Presbyterian, so there are three parts. And the first part is verses 1 to 3. The honor of God's name. And now, this admonition, uh, we should use a, a more modern word, I think, this warning is for you, O priests. And it's not just for the priests uh, or for the leaders. Uh, Andrea read uh, 1 Peter 2, 9, which says, you, Peter writing to all the believers, you are a royal priesthood, picking up uh, a theme from Exodus 19. So it's a word for leadership and the leadership in Bloomfield, uh, the ministry team, the elders, the committee members, the leaders of organizations, but it's also a word for all of us here because now in the new covenant, we are all priests to the Most High. So it's a warning for us. If you do not listen, and if you do not set a note the phrase, your heart to honor my name, says the Lord God, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not, and he repeats, repeats the phrase, set your heart to honor me. Your motive in what you do should be but isn't in the first place to honor me, says the Lord. It's the charity shop again, only it's now the church. I will give the church what we don't really use. They can do something with it. When in fact, we should be giving to God and the Christian community our best and our most. Now, I'm resisting the uh, temptation to go off into tithing and all of that. Uh, maybe we'll, I'll have an opportunity of doing that sometime, but tonight isn't that time. The principle is, and what we all must ask ourselves is, is our top priority in the way we live, in the way we work, in the way we relate to other people to honor our Lord? Now, I know how I answer that question. It's sometimes, but sometimes not. we all have to honor to answer that question. The honor of God's name and the consequences of dishonoring his name in the text are first a curse, verse 2. I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Now, that phrase can be taken in two ways. Your blessings can mean the blessings that God gives you as you serve him, and they're going to be greatly affected if we're not giving him first place. So it can mean the blessings we receive, he's going to curse. Or it can mean, seeing he was uh, talking or to priests, uh, it could mean the blessings they impose upon others. We bless people when uh, specific events in church. A baptism, we sing the ironic blessing. Uh, an ordination, we sing the ironic blessing. We bless people. And it's wonderful when you hear that you've been a blessing to other people. Is it not? Simply wonderful. Um, I was praying for something I didn't normally pray for oh, a number of weeks ago. And I heard secondhand that that really had blessed a member of this congregation. And I hadn't known anything about it boy, did I feel good that the Lord had used me. I 
and he uses very strange instruments, but he had used me on this occasion to bless somebody. Wonderful thrill makes it. Well, not exactly all worthwhile, because you have to do it when you're not a blessing, but it really helps. It really helps. And what does Malachi say? You priests, you're in the blessing business. That's what you do. It's going to be cursing. That's the value you are going to have in your half-hearted service for me. This is heavy stuff, but it's a heavy profit. A curse, a rebuke to their descendants. Uh, Because of you, verse 3, I will rebuke your descendants. That probably means that he's going to cut off the line and they, the Levites will lose the privilege of being priests if they didn't buck up. And then, uh, thirdly, he's going to humiliate them. Now, uh, the second bit of verse 3, the language is very strong. He refers to, in sacrifices, uh, the animal was, was slain, and then the, uh, it's what they found in its bowels and some of the innards, what we might call the guts, uh, th- that was all uh, taken away and burnt. And what Malachi, what the Lord says through Malachi, I will spread on your faces the offal from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. Well, now, uh, the, the, the commentators debate on how literally they should translate this. And they want to give a feeling of what Malachi is saying, but they feel if they translate it too literally, people will be so shocked they won't listen to the rest of the uh, the, 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 the passage. They will say, do you believe what, what our minister said in church last Sunday night? So we have to go easy. It's a lot stronger than this. But the, the, today's English version translated, I will splatter your face with dung and you will be carried off to the dung hill. Now, I'm not going to do any stronger than that. That's strong enough. But isn't it strong? They were refusing to give God the honor. And the Lord said, right, I will dishonor you in the most humiliating way. Second point of three. We see the, the value of God's covenant Now, this is a bit tricky here because he talks about the covenant with Levi. Now, how many have heard of the covenant with Levi? Okay. Not many. I always get an answer from over here, and it's usually right. Uh, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob, and his descendants were privileged with the priesthood. Moses and Aaron were of the tribe of Levi. Now, in Genesis, there's no record of God making a covenant with Levi. And indeed, the references to Levi um, Uh, somebody points out, uh, aren't uh, the the most complimentary. They're not the most complimentary, and you can check it in Genesis. You get the phrase, covenant with the Levites in Jeremiah. And there are a number of covenants in the Old Testament, as you know. The main one is the covenant which came 
to Moses and through Moses to the people on Sinai. Now, that was the Old Testament covenant, and that was normally, Paul calls it, the law. But under the over it, the, the overarch of the covenant uh, with Moses, there were other covenants that were part of it, like the covenant with David and his line, that he would be king, and the covenant with Levi and his line, that they would be priests. Okay? And Levi, or the example of Levi or the Levites, uh, the Better ones are, we find, in verses 4 to 6. And it's a, it's a very positive picture here. My covenant, well, what does he say? Verse 4. I have sent you this admonition that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him a covenant of life, and peace, of life and well-being, that I gave to him, this called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned Many from sin. Now, he says, my covenant with Levi will continue. It was God's plan that the Old Testament covenants would continue until Jesus came, fulfilled them, and then they were superseded by the new covenant in Christ, which wasn't uh, like uh, Moses, the covenant with Moses, or wasn't like what he calls here the covenant with Levi. But it was continuing until that time, which for Malachi was in the future, but for us, of course, is in the past. And he, this covenant has value, value. And, and I've been thinking about that. When Jesus was asked about the, how you would summarize the covenant, the Old Testament covenant, the law, his response was to ask the uh, the lawyer, and he said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. That was, and Jesus said, excellent. That's a good summary. And another summary is the the Ten Commandments, which we find in Exodus 20. And I was thinking, you know, the Ten Commandments still have value. Now, Keeping the Ten Commandments won't save you. Won't save you. But if more people kept the Ten Commandments, society would be a much better place. You know, uh, what do we find? Well, I'm getting bored hearing more scandals from the banks. Our whole banking system has been corrupt for years. And you begin to say, what morality does our capitalist system have? It is not immoral, it is amoral. There doesn't seem to be any ethical basis at all. And for truth, well, just think about the United States and fake news and all that kind of thing. Truth is no longer valued. We need the simple teaching of the commandments. Commandments 1 to 4, honoring God, putting him in the right position. 5 to 10, loving our neighbors as ourselves. The value of 
the covenant. And then on to my last point, which is verses 7 to 9, and I look back again to Levi, the requirements upon the priests, God's leaders uh, upon us all. Verse 7. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, and from his mouth men should seek instruction, because he is the messenger of the Lord. Now, I don't know whether uh, Damien dealt with this last week or indeed uh, earlier. Uh, The the name Malachi means my servant. And indeed, when you read the books, there's a big debate as to whether it was a title, my servant, or whether it was uh, a, a, a proper name. And it doesn't matter. But here, Malachi, my servant, is saying... I am God's servant, but so are you. So are you. The lips of a priest, that's all of you, verse 7, because he is the Malach, the servant of the Lord. And as servants of the Lord, how are we living? How are we living? It concerns how we use our lips. Verse 7, for the lips of the priest. And if we go uh, back earlier, verse 6, the example of Levi, nothing false was found on his lips. True instruction was in his mouth. And verse 7, the the priest ought to preserve knowledge in his teaching. From his mouth, men and women should seek instruction. It's to do with our lips, our teaching, and our speech. Now, who doesn't have problems from time to time? Maybe it's more often than time to time with our speech. Critical, sharp, unworthy. How are you doing? Not very well. Yeah. Yeah, it's our lips. And uh, frighteningly, uh, verse 8, he talks about, uh, by your teaching you have caused many to stumble. Remember that verse in Matthew 18 where Jesus said if anybody causes one of these little ones who believe in me, a young convert, if anyone causes one of them to stumble it would be better for them that what? A millstone was put round their neck and they were drowned in the depths of the sea. What a horror. And why did what sin deserved that outcome? Causing any young Christian, anyone, to stumble. Now that's scary. And that's why we have to continually, things may be okay to do in a vacuum but not in a context where young believers or young people or sometimes young believers can be 75. Not in in a context where we can affect other people and be a stumbling block in their Christian walk. It's to do with the lips. It's to do with the feet. Verse 6b, Levi again, he walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. Evangelistic. And what was his means of evangelism? The way he lived. And then perhaps 
most important of all, the heart. Throughout this passage, setting our heart to honor him. That's the fundamental. Where we are within as related to God, and then expressed in our mouths and in our actions and in our ways. I was thinking for an illustration to end this uh, sermon. And you you could call this sermon uh, giving God his place. Honoring is giving God his place. And I thought of a wee lad. Uh, Maybe it was me about 12 when my father bought his first car. Morris Minor, 1953. It was delivered to our front door. And uh, that was interesting because he had never driven a car in his life. But we won't get into that. But but, uh, what I was thinking of was, uh, uh, you know, you you, you get a 12-year-old behind the wheel waiting for his dad to come. And he imagines he's steering and he can make all the noises and change gears. Brum, 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 brum. You know the kind of thing? And then dad arrives and he says, All right, dad, I'll drive. And dad says, Move over. And they don't get going. Or if they do get going, they won't get very far if the, the child doesn't give the father the control. Giving God his place. Let's stop thinking that we can live our lives and get a bit of glory ourselves. The glory is to be his. We are to follow follow the example of the saints of all ages, but follow the example preeminently of God. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and let him take the controls. Let's pray. Sometimes, O Lord, we need strong language, coarse speech, striking figures and pictures to make us pay attention. Use whatever means you choose to make us pay attention to you tonight and grant that we may not be like those priests of old but walk with you in well-being and righteousness that our lips and our feet and our hearts may all be bringing glory to your name through Christ our Lord.